Hi everyone. As we finish out this chapter and move on to the next, I want you all to try to link the doctrines that we've been discussing around conditions in this chapter with the equitable balancing that we've seen in previous chapters. How do notions of reliance, assumption of risk by the parties, parties conducting due diligence, parties intent, and a court's interpretation in the different ways that they can look at a contract and the evidence around the party's intent, how do these all play together as a court is faced with parties who have very different ideas about what their performance obligations are, if any, under a contract. Because this semester we really are sort of shifting our focus to, in some ways, the court who is tasked with deciding what did the parties really mean and what does the court ultimately choose to legally bind the parties to at the end of a case. So with that, let's start by picking up after our Jacobs and Young v. Kent case and jumping from there to a discussion of conditions of satisfaction. You may recall that Cardozo hinted at this analysis when he suggested that perhaps there was some distinction to be drawn between things that are of a more artistic nature and things that are mere utility. He seemed to be implying there that courts would take a potentially different approach depending on whether an obligation fit into one category or the other. And as we discussed in our last session for the Jacobs and Young v. Kent case, Cardozo clearly saw the pipes as a mere utility. That ties into these notions of conditions of satisfaction. Recall our discussion last semester about consideration and illusory promises. This idea that a party must only perform once it has been satisfied that can seem like it's illusory. It feels like an open-ended escape clause. But even if contracts are silent as to the conditions of a party's satisfaction, courts will usually infer conditions for satisfaction. So in the case of art or performance that is more subjective, courts might say that the rejection by the party who is claiming they had a condition of satisfaction, that that rejection must be made in good faith. For something that is more commercial or technical, courts might apply a commercial reasonableness standard. Um, in both of these cases, the parties that are claiming a condition of satisfaction obviously need to put on evidence to show that either if we're talking about something that is taste or artistic judgment, that that decision was made in good faith, Right? that their satisfaction, or rather their dissatisfaction, was good faith. And similarly, if it's more of a business or commercial party on which the court might be more likely to use a technical or commercial standard, the party would have to show evidence as to why the 
dissatisfaction. It's typically how this works, right? A condition of satisfaction is not met, therefore I do not have to perform, that that decision was commercially reasonable. So recall um, few chapters back, we talked about this case of Matai v. Hopper, the mall case. So there, the buyer had a condition that its purchase was subject to obtaining leases satisfactory to the purchaser. And the court there said, well, that's not illusory. And they Interestingly, in that case, Matai v. Hopper, which seems like something, you know, commercial leasing would seem like they were going to apply a commercial standard. Interestingly there, the court suggested that there were so many variables involved in the decision to purchase and obtaining leases satisfactory to the purchaser that the court said it was going to apply the more subjective good faith standard. Although, you know, something to think about here, in the Matai v. Hopper case, it wasn't actually the buyer or the purchaser who was trying to get out of the transaction. It was the seller of the land who was trying to claim, well, the contract was a nullity because the purchaser had made this illusory promise. And so I think that that might have influenced the court's balancing of the equities there in suggesting that they were going to give, in some ways, an easier or more subjective standard to the party who they felt like was not trying to get out of the contract. Another example of conditions of satisfaction applied is the case of Incombi Thermo Spa. So in that case, there's a spa maker and they urge the court to find an implied condition of satisfaction uh, such that if Thermo Spa was not satisfied, it could terminate its contract with income. And so there they said, court, find an implied condition of satisfaction. The court in that case refused to imply such a term in the absence of express language. And it said it might consider commercial reasonableness but there didn't seem to be anything deficient or unskillful in income's performance, so there was no relief available for the spa maker who wanted to get out of a contract. It's hard to argue, um, as the text observes, that you're not satisfied with something in good faith when you can't really point to what it was that was causing you dissatisfaction. All right, so let's move on to talking a little bit about conditions and sequencing. As I suggested last week, I'm not sure this notion of a promissory condition is the most straightforward way to think about a condition that is also a promise. A, a promissory condition is just a term that's doing two things at once. And it matters because, as we discussed last week, the remedy differs when something is merely a condition, in which case the condition's failure to occur excuses performance by a party, versus something that is a promise, which is breached, in which case the other party can both refuse to perform and claim contractual damages. 
What's maybe more confusing is situation where a court reads a series of what are written as promises, what your book might call concurrent promissory conditions. So this is the idea that if a series of performances could occur instantaneously or simultaneously, then that's probably how a court is going to interpret them. One party not performing releases the other party from not performing. There's still promises. The first party who fails to perform is in breach of contract, though you know, what options exist to cure that breach, that's going to be something that we'll talk about next chapter. So just because a party breaches, fails to honor a promise, doesn't automatically mean that the party who is the victim of that breach gets to declare the contract null and void and go straight for damages. So we'll talk about these notions of cure and of mitigation and those sorts of things as we move forward. The other main interpretive rule, which I believe I mentioned last week and I'll reiterate, is that if one performance will take longer to complete and a contract is silent on sequencing, then the longer performance must be completed before the other party is typically viewed as having to tender its performance. So the common uh, scenario here is if something is going to take a long time to perform like a service, then typically, unless the contract says expressly, then payment comes at the end of the service, not up front. A few points just as you see in the slide to remind you about conditions and sequencing. Um, a condition precedent is something that has to be satisfied before another party's performance becomes due. Um, so if that condition precedent is not satisfied, the other party has an argument that they shouldn't have to perform. Some conditions, as we saw last class, also have express or implied promises associated with them, like those implied promises to use good faith efforts to seek out a loan. Courts may imply or construe promises in a contract to be conditions for concurrent or subsequent actions by parties. And so the example that we talked about last week were these ideas behind payment. So if it says, you know, buyer will pay, seller will turn over the house or turn over the goods, the idea there is that even though those are essentially stated as concurrent promises, they're also conditions of one another. If buyer doesn't pay, seller doesn't have to give over the goods or the thing or what have you. Um, parties can explicitly structure around implied conditions. So if we're talking about um, a scenario where you want the payment up front, then you can easily write in buyer will pay on thus and such date or by thus and such date, seller will deliver by thus and such date. So you can build in that time. This is just a way of getting around what a court might imply. Again, the language of the contract is supposed to control. And so if you write something in expressly, courts are going to do their best to honor that. 
sometimes though parties will ignore a condition that is expressly included in the contract between the parties. This is usually um, a situation where even though a party's performance might have been excused by perhaps the failure of a condition to be met, the parties go on acting like they still have a contract, as though they are still going to perform fully under the contract. Usually, uh, this is just by the party's actions themselves, so there's not really a formal acknowledgement often that, oh, I don't have to perform now because this condition was met, my performance should be excused. Um, in the real world, parties often fail to provide perfect performance under a contract. You know, instead, they perform imperfectly. And so for in a world where courts can say, well, you promise to do this, and your promise to do this is a condition on the other party having to do something else. And you imperfectly perform, but the party keeps on acting like your performance is acceptable. Well, what do you do in those situations? You know, when the other party seems to be accepting imperfect performance, questions arise, especially once you know a dispute arises and the court has to figure out, okay, what did the parties really mean for this contract to be? Um, so in accepting your imperfect performance or um, in accepting the fact that a condition occurred, did occur and they could have been excused and they went on performing anyway, um, does this waive other rights under the contract? If the party that seemed to be allowing you to imperfectly perform decides, no, I really want you to strictly comply with this contract, um, did its previous actions serve to change the terms of your deal? Um, if parties want to change the terms of their contract to match the imperfect, the not strictly complying performance that's now happening, do they need to do so formally through a modification to the contract? Again, keeping in mind that in common law, some of the doctrines around modification say you need consideration. You know, the UCC allows modification without consideration, but common law still says that you're supposed to have it. So we've discussed that you know, parties can modify contracts either in writing or orally. So that's certainly something parties can do. Oftentimes, however, we're looking at situations where it's somewhat unclear. The parties haven't created a very clear path for the court to follow to see what the party's intent really is in the situation. Um, for waiver, which is the knowing and voluntary abandonment of a right by words or conduct, right? So you can either show your waiver by saying or writing it down. Um, frankly, more often and in the more confusing cases, you end up um, committing waiver simply by your conduct, oftentimes by not protesting in a given situation. Um, in those situations, we want to look at who the condition was meant to benefit. Um, if, for example, let's go back to Wild the Wolfhound. Um, in that scenario, 
the condition was set up something like, I don't have to pay um, for Wild the Wolfhound unless I get a loan. And let's say I don't get the loan, but I decide I'll scrape together the cash, so I will pay in $1,000 cash, then the seller probably has to accept my waiver of that condition that I get a loan um, because the condition was meant to benefit me. So if the seller decided, oh wait, I could sell this wolfhound for $2,000 rather than $1,000. Oh, you didn't get the loan? It, it, that's a condition. Now I don't have to perform. That that would not be a strong argument, right? Because that condition was meant to benefit me as the buyer. On the other hand, one of the conditions that we had discussed was my providing a letter from my landlord saying I can have wolfhounds in my apartment. So let's say in this scenario, I fail to provide the letter from my landlord saying I can have wolfhounds in the apartment. And seller doesn't realize this until the seller's already tendered me the dog. I already have the dog. And the seller says, wait, I never got that letter saying that you are allowed to have wolfhounds in your apartment. You have to give the dog back. Right? They're trying to rescind the transaction. Right? I say, no, seller, you waived your right to that condition when you gave me the dog. Now, the seller, right? So here, this is a situation where I am the non-waiving party. Right? The seller was the one who arguably by their conduct waived the condition that they get the letter about my being able to have dogs. So now I, as the non-waiving party, am trying to raise waiver. In that case, the waiver is supposed to be uh, non-material or for additional consideration. That essentially makes it a formal modification of the contract. There's no consideration here, no additional consideration. Right, it would be different if I said, hey, seller, I never got that letter from my landlord, but I think it's gonna be okay. How about, you know, I give you 50 extra bucks just in case, right? Then there's been consideration for the seller's waiver of that condition of having the letter. Here, we don't have that in my initial scenario. It's just seller didn't see the letter, gave me the dog anyway, now is trying to assert that condition. I'm saying you've waived it. So in that case, the waiver is supposed to be non-material to the transaction. So the seller's argument then becomes, no, that was a material condition to the contract. I needed that letter saying that you could have a wolfhound in your apartment. I didn't receive it. That was material. I didn't waive it. So that's this idea of waiver, and the waiver is supposed to be a knowing and voluntary abandonment of a right. And so the defense is largely going to be around these notions of it, it was not knowing and voluntary. If, if you're arguing that I committed waiver, but I didn't know I was doing it, or you know, conversely, that waiver was meant to, or that condition that you're saying I've waived, was meant to benefit me. Why would I waive that condition? It's material to the contract. Now, estoppel arguments don't require um, knowing and voluntary they don't require materiality. Um, 
you're familiar already with this notion of of estoppel. We've talked about it throughout our course. So in an estoppel, a party indicates that they will perform despite non-fulfillment of a condition. Often they do this um, carelessly. They perform even though a condition hasn't been fulfilled, sort of unknowingly, um, only later realizing that a condition wasn't fulfilled, they didn't have to perform, now they're trying to um, essentially backtrack. And given the name Estoppel, you're probably not surprised to see that this is the doctrine that requires a justifiable reliance and a detriment right, in order to make the argument. You have to say, be able to say, um, no, you can't go back. You can't go and assert that condition now and say you don't have to perform because I have changed my position in reliance on your actions. So even if it is a material change to the contract, you can still argue estoppel. And so we'll see estoppel a lot in cases where it appears the actions of one party have led another party who was imperfectly performing to think, oh, it seems like they're okay, like they're excusing my imperfect performance. So for instance, with my landlord who's saying, oh no, that letter was material to the contract, I could also argue estoppel, um, and that might help overcome seller's materiality arguments. I would say, oh, well, I, I relied on getting to keep the dog. I bought, bought the dog food. I bought it a bed. I bought it many very expensive large size outfits. I signed Wild the Wolfhound up for doggy daycare at K9 to 5. Look at all this money I'm out thinking that you, the seller, were legitimately going forward with this contract. Let's finish with a hypothetical. You enter into a contract with Wolfenit, a dog walking company. They will walk your pug Pickles, the dog, once a day for the next year and you will pay them $150 a month due on the first of each month. The contract says, expressly in the contract, that if you don't pay on the first of the month, Wolfenit can cancel the contract or charge you a $5 a day late fee. You pay on time on the first of the month for three months. Then you get busy and you forget to send in your check until the 10th of the month. Are you in breach of the contract? Could they charge you the late fee? Yeah. Contract expressly says pay on the 1st. If you pay on the 10th, yes, you are late. You are in breach. Right? They can cancel. They can charge you your $5 a day late fee. Um, now some contracts will build in some sort of grace period or require that there be notice that you have failed to pay or that they failed to receive payment. Um, that's something you could expressly include, but you know, in terms of what did you promise to do, pay on the first, are you in breach of that promise? Yes. So say the first time that you pay late Wolfenit just cashes the check, doesn't assess you any late fee. Uh, next month, you send your check in on the 10th. Can Wolfenit charge late fees now? Um, are you in breach? 
Yes, still in breach according to the express terms of the contract. And you know, has there been sufficient conduct to make the kind of arguments that we were talking about on the previous slide? Maybe, but this still seems like a scenario where they probably have a pretty strong argument to assert their legal rights under the contract. So yeah, they probably can charge you the late fee. What would your legal argument be at this point? Um, it's, well, they implicitly waived the late fee the first time. Right? But does that one waiver constitute what we might call a sufficient course of performance to say, well, they've waived the late fee for all future checks. Similarly, right, would that first waiver scenario, the first time they didn't assert their right to charge you the fee, be sufficient for you to say, oh, well, I was now relying on them not collecting or not assessing my late fee, uh, so they're stopped. There's an estoppel argument. Now they can't ever charge me a late fee again. All right. One time, a one-time waiver may not be enough in this scenario to imply um, continued waiver or estoppel. All right. Now, assume you've always paid late right, from day one. And after six months of cashing your late checks without assessing the penalty, Wolfenet has had it and wants to start charging you for being tardy. Um, you send in the late check, they assert the fee. Right? You're 10 days late, $5 a day late fee. Right? What are your legal arguments here? Well, now you're arguing it's been six months, I've never paid on time, waiver by their conduct, right? They've waived their right to assess this late fee, to essentially assert their right under the contract to charge me this late fee because of the previous six months of conduct. Right? Is this a modification? No, you haven't given any additional consideration here, and it's not a modification. You have to argue waiver. Now, going back to some of the discussion around waiver and estoppel, right, the party who the waiver is meant to benefit can, or whom the sort of legal right that is being waived, I should say, is meant to benefit, can essentially reassert their right under the contract, although they're supposed to give notice. Okay. So what does Woofing It need to do to make sure you know you have to pay on time the next month? They need to tell you, we are going to require strict compliance with the contract going forward. Right. They have been waiving it. Um, it's meant to benefit you know, them, the ability to charge the late fee. They can unilaterally rescind it. Right. They unilaterally waived it. They can unilaterally rescind. If you had negotiated late payments in some way, if you'd given consideration for them, if it had actually been a modification, right, then you're talking about something that's mutual. They can't unilaterally rescind it. But if it's just you're arguing, oh, your behavior has been a waiver, Right, and it's a waiver of 
a term or condition that's meant to benefit them, then they can rescind it. Right? But they do probably need to give you notice. Um, if you were Wolf and its counsel, and the CEO said he wanted to give people a break the first time they paid late, but actually charge a late fee every time after that, what advice do you give the CEO um, upon receipt of that first late payment? Right? It's notice. Right? you need to make sure that the other party, the party that's paying late, understands that Wolfinet is not waiving their rights under the contract. So you need to explicitly acknowledge that Wolfinet is waiving this first fee that's late, but after that, they're gonna assess late fees. So you want to make sure that you're not giving the customers the ability to say there's been a course of performance or there's been waiver of this right under the contract. So this waiver and estoppel, especially, frankly, waiver, allows parties to fail to assert their rights, um, to frankly create a new course of performance under the contract um, without having to go through the formalities of a modification. But you know, depending on whether there's been reliance by the other party that might amount to an estoppel, it does allow the party who is doing the waiver to bring a right back to life, to sort of reassert the term or condition later if they want strict performance. Again, subject to arguments of estoppel due to reliance by the other party who thought that they had a waiver of the right from the other party. All right, that's where I'm going to have us end for this video. We will pick up in our live session talking about the discussion problems and the cases for the end of chapter 18. See you then.